I'm Laurel Weldon. Um, I'm the Dean of the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences at Simon Fraser University. And it is my great pleasure today to welcome you here uh, in the Siegel Building, home of SFU's BD School of Business, uh, located on the unceded traditional territories of the Squamish, the Sailtooth, and the Musqueam uh, nations. And that is uh, the land on which SFU Vancouver has the good fortune to be located. We are gathered here uh, for the occasion of the seventh annual Edward and Emily McQuinney Memorial Lecture, which tonight features uh, Professor Elizabeth Prodromu, visiting scholar in the International Studies Program at Boston College and non-resident senior fellow at Atlantic Council's Eurasia Center. So I hope you're as excited as I am to hear her speak. Before we get to the more interesting, or maybe not more interesting, but before we get to the, um, well, I hope not more interesting, but before we get to the, uh, the actual introduction of the uh, lecturer, let me say a couple words about the uh, memorial lecture and about their, the namesake of the memorial lecture, Edward and Emily McQuinney. This lecture was established in 2017 to honor the memory of two longtime supporters of Hellenic studies here at Simon Fraser University. Uh, it, the lecture series is devoted to contemporary issues of global interest. This aspect of the lecture series, its commitment to this kind of global vision, is very much in line with Ted McQuinney's life and career. And I had uh, the good fortune to actually be a student in Ed McQuinney's classes when I was an undergraduate here at Simon Fraser. And Ed McQuinney's life actually exemplifies the kind of global engagement that um, SFU is known for and aspires to deepen. Uh, he was one of the foremost experts on the Canadian Constitution. If you ever met him, you, you know how uh, the weight of his expertise. He felt at ease in academia, having held professorships at Yale, the Sorbonne, Toronto, McGill, and came to rest here at Simon Fraser University. Uh, he was the author of many books, and he also provided expert advice to international bodies such as the United Nations, to foreign governments, as well as providing advice to us here at home, the Canadian government. He was actively, at the same time as being such a distinguished scholar, he was actively involved in public affairs. And this is what I mean by being sort of the kind of global engaged spirit that we um, admire. He, in the 1990s, served full, two full terms as a member of parliament and as parliamentary secretary. Both Edward and his wife, Emily, were committed to academic excellence and to public service. So tonight's event, which is now part of a very well-established lecture series, of which we're very proud, along with the McQuinney Professorship, which is, which is in the Department of Global Humanities, is part of this couple's lasting legacy here at SFU. So tonight's lecture is order organized by the Stavros Nyarkos Foundation, uh, Foundation Center for Hellenic Studies. It supports public discussion of the topics that so animated the McQuinney's professional and intellectual lives. The SNF Center for Hellenic Studies, founded in 2011 with a generous grant by the Stavros Nyarkos Foundation, uh, is a, one of our foremost research centers at the university, commits, committed to the support of research by both faculty and students to issues related to the history and culture of Greece and the Greek world broadly defined. The faculty and staff in Hellenic studies look to Hellenism as a global phenomenon. And as such, they are very well situated here in a global city of Vancouver, a setting that enables uh, the quest to study this topic in a creative way. So the, the SNF Center for Hellenic Studies and its faculty uh, set are um, a central part of the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences, the faculty of which I'm dean here at SFU, and of the Department of the Humanities. So on the behalf of the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences at Simon Fraser University, I'd like to thank you all for attending tonight and ask you to welcome James Horncastle, uh, who, sorry, proponent to Demetrius, to James Horncastle, <laughs> who will, uh, um, now introduce, uh, he's the holder of the Edward and Emily McQuinney Professorship in International Relations, and I'd like to invite him to the stage to introduce today's speaker. Thank you. Dear friends of Hellenic Studies, friends of Greece, its culture and history, as the Edward and Emily McQuinney Professor in International Relations, I am thrilled to be greeting you here to contemplate with our speaker the role of Russia's religious influence building in Greece. Before we get to our talk, however, I would like to say a few words on the center, the speaker series, and Dr. Prodromu. Those of you who have been with us and have followed the activities of the SNF Center for Hellenic Studies for the 12 years of its existence 
will know that these type of topics are very much of interest to our community of Hellenists and our audiences. We have, over the years, sought to tackle them by way of two main avenues. On one hand, we organized the always fresh academic speaker series at SFU up on Burnaby Mountain. On the other hand, our seminars are buttressed by select wider audience events, such as the one we are all attending today. Over the years, the Edward and Emily McQuinney talks have hosted Lucas Sukalis from the University of Athens in LEMF, Dimitris Papadimitriou from the University of Manchester, Aris Milanas from George Washington University's Elliott School of International Affairs, Roman Yero Dimos, a professor of global current affairs at Bournemouth University, and Statis Kalivas from Oxford University. The center has also, however, engaged with politics directly. We do not believe that academia is solely a space for detachment and isolation from politics. Thus, over the years, you have had the opportunity to follow talks by individuals from PASOK, New Democracy, as well as Syriza. On each occasion, we sought to expose our Vancouver audience to perspectives from established and emerging politicians who had, or would at some point play, a role in shaping affairs in Greece. Today, we pivot back to academic reflection with somebody who exemplifies how academic research can shape public policy and debate in Elizabeth Prodromo. Elizabeth Prodromo is a visiting scholar in the International Studies program at Boston College, where she will join the academic faculty in the upcoming year. Her research interests and policy work focus on the intersections of geopolitics, religion, and human rights, with particular focus on the Eastern Mediterranean and Middle East. Dr. Prodromo served as a diplomatic appointment on the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom from 2004 through 2012. And she was also a member of the U.S. Secretary of State's Religion and Foreign Policy Working Group from 2011 through 2015. The author of two edited volumes and many book chapters, her most recent publication deals with Russian influence building through religious soft power in the Kremlin Playbook 3, Keeping the Faith. She has published widely in peer-reviewed journals, such as the Journal of World Christianity, Journal of Democracy, Journal of American Academy of Religion, Orvis, Survival, and the European Journal of Political Research. Dr. Prodromo is also a frequent commentator and contributor in US and international media, and she has offered expert testimony and briefings to policy-making bodies, such as the US Helsinki Commission, the European Parliament, and the Organization for the Security and Cooperation in Europe. She has held visiting research appointments at the Center for American Progress, the Hedia International Center for Excellence for Countering Violent Extremism, the Hudson Institute, among others. She has also taught at Tufts University, Boston University, and Princeton University. And she was a consultant member of the delegation of the Ecumenical Patriarchate at the Holy and Great Council of the Orthodox Church in 2016. Once Dr. Prodromo is done with her presentation, we will be having a Q&A session so I request that you save your questions for the end of the presentation. Now, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Prodromo to give her talk entitled Russia's Religious Influence Building in Greece. Thank you. OK, then. It's wonderful to be here. Um, I'd like to start by thanking the Stavros Niarchos Foundation Center for Hellenic Studies here at Simon Fraser for the invitation to offer this year's McKinney, McWinney Memorial Lecture. It's really an honor to be part of this annual lecture series that speaks to the significance of Greece and the legacy of Hellenism in contemporary international relations. So thank you for the warm welcome. I, I want to especially thank um, McWinney Professor Dr. James Horncastle, Jamie, thank you for your generous introduction and also your entire department, your faculty, your students, the dean uh, for the incredible hospitality that I've experienced here for the last several days. You're making it hard to go back to the, um, the intense east coast of the United States. Everyone's been really wonderful, so thank you to the Global Humanities Department and the entire university. It's a pleasure to see distinguished uh, guests here as well. Uh, I'm going to turn now to my lecture topic for the evening, which, as um, Dr. Horncastle said, is Russia's religious influence building in Greece, geopolitical disruption, and orthodox transnational competition. My goal this evening will be to outline the causes, mechanisms, and objectives that are in play in Russia for influence building in Greece. While I speak about Russian influence building, I'm going to focus mainly on the activities of the Moscow Patriarchate, of the Russian Orthodox Church, 
<clears throat> although, as will become clear in the course of my remarks, the influence building project involves a partnership between the Moscow Patriarchate and the Kremlin, targeting Greece's religious ecosystem towards two goals. First, geopolitical disruption within NATO in order to support Russia's strategic goals in the Eastern Mediterranean with multiplier effects on three continents, Europe, Asia, and Africa. <clears throat> and second, competition for leadership in the transnational community of orthodoxy, which also implies a sustained effort to undermine the leadership of the ecumenical patriarchate of Constantinople. So I'm going to proceed in four parts, all very synoptic because of time constraints. First, I'll share the background to this research. Uh, Dr. Horncastle touched on some of that, and I want to introduce the typology of power that runs through my analysis. Second, I'll talk about Russia's logic in targeting Greece's religious ecosystem for influence building. Third, I'll provide a couple of illustrative examples of the main operational spaces, that is the Church of Greece and Mount Athos, and the types of power tools that Russia deploys for influence building and malign activities. And then finally, I'll offer some suggestions about the challenges of measuring impact in these influence building activities and about a future research agenda that builds on what I'll share with you tonight, and in particular, the salience of the Greek case for broader comparative research. So let me turn to the background to this, this study and the background to the Greek case. Uh, my research on Russian influence building and disruption in Greece was part of the project that Dr. Horncastle mentioned, a project with the Center for Strategic and International Studies, which is an internationally renowned think tank located in Washington, D.C. The project, which is now available in publication form, is called Kremlin Playbook 3, Keeping the Faith. This was a project, in, a project involving a team of six scholar policymakers, and the Greece chapter is one of four cases, Greece, Bosnia, Herzegovina, France, and Georgia, in a study that asked the following questions. First, are Russia's malign influence operations in economics and politics, these were issues that were extensively explored in the first two Kremlin playbooks, accompanied by similar influence building and disruption activities related to religion? And by that, we meant the, either the instrumentalization of religion by the Kremlin and or the autonomous activities of the Moscow Patriarchate in its own influence building and disruptions in global orthodoxy. And our second question was, what are the targets, tactics, and strategies and tools for those operations? Our working hypotheses were as follows. First, that the Kremlin wants to influence people's beliefs, values, traditions, and practices, so that this will then influence their political choices and behaviors, as well as their geostrategic orientations and geopolitical actions, in order to support Russia's great power aspirations since the end of the Cold War, and especially during the tenure of Vladimir Putin, which began in 1999. Our second working hypothesis was that in order to accomplish these goals, <clears throat> the Kremlin has instrumentalized religion, therefore necessitating a collaboration with the Russian Orthodox Church because the Moscow Patriarchate has the capacity to operate transnationally. It has the capacity, therefore, to influence beliefs, and it has the institutional capacity for influence at the intersection of geopolitics and religion. Now, the earlier playbooks had undertaken analysis to support the conclusion that Russia's malign influence efforts across a series of country cases in Europe turned on a systematic, albeit sometimes very opaque, network of patronage that the Kremlin uses to influence and direct decision making, with the goal then being to weaken democratic systems from within by using existing and creating new societal divides. The third, although this third Kremlin playbook hypothesized that the instrumentalization of religion was a relatively recent, albeit especially pernicious development in Russia's malign activities, my research on Greece pointed to far deeper historical roots of the salience of religion as an influence building tool, both for the Moscow Patriarchate and the Kremlin, underscoring the need then to take religion seriously and trying to understand 
historical as well as current geopolitical developments and international relations. And on a brief aside here, um, the war in Ukraine, I think, has led to a relative explosion of interest in Orthodox Christianity and religion more generally as it relates to Russian inva Russia's invasion. And this, in turn, has led to a resuscitation of interest in the 2019 decision by the Ecumenical Patriarchate to grant autocephaly to the Orthodox Church of Ukraine. So exploring the, is the significance of influence building in the Greek case could also be helpful in understanding rather than misunderstanding the relevance of religion in the war in Ukraine. Now, finally, to conclude this introduction, just checking my timer here, not my texts. Okay, finally, to conclude this introduction, uh, I want to offer a word on the, the concept of power and the term power, because what is evident in Russia's religious influence building is an understanding of the different types of power that can be utilized to accomplish geostrategic objectives. And because of time constraints, I'll be ridiculously synoptic here. But power is a concept that is indeed ancient and ubiquitous. It cuts across intellectual disciplines. Um, and although power is intuitively grasped as relational, the great Yale political scientist Robert Dahl observed in 1957 that there are great challenges in producing a single, consistent, coherent theory of power. And renowned Harvard Kennedy School political scientist Joseph Nye echoed that observation many decades later when in, two, in 2005 he said, power is like the weather. Everyone depends on it and talks about it, but few understand it. Power is also like love, easier to experience than to define or measure, but no less real for that. Now, despite these cautions about what power means, there is consensus on the meaning of all types of power, and I'll get to four types in a moment. And that is that power is the ability to affect others to obtain the outcomes you want, or the ability to influence another to act in ways in which that entity would not have acted otherwise. Now, Nye and others since the latter part of the 20th century have classified four types of power, and I'm gonna use those as I move now through the case. Um, these are hard, soft, sharp, and smart. The nature of these four types of power has consequences for the concrete tools and strategies that can be used to influence the behavior of others to get the outcomes that you want. The abbreviated description of these four types of power are as follows. Hard power is power that is coercive, and it entails the ability of states and non-state actors to coerce others' behavior through actions, through threats, intimidation, inducements, or payments. So the primary resources of hard power are material, namely force and economics and finance. Soft power is persuasive, it's attractive, it's co-optive, and it entails getting others to want the outcomes that you want by shaping the preferences of others. The primary resources of soft power then are ideational, uh, or normative, and they, that includes religion, culture, values, norms. Sharp power is a more recent category, and sharp power is manipulative and distractive as opposed to coercive or persuasive, persuasive. And it's sharp because it pierces, penetrates, or perforates the political and information environments in targeted countries. The resources of sharp power are overwhelmingly technological. And then finally, smart power, a uh, recent term, more recent term, it was actually mainstreamed by Hillary Clinton uh, when she was uh, in her confirmation hearings as US Secretary of State, those hearings in 2009. She was talking, she talked about the US using smart power, that is a combination of these other elements of power. Now the resources of smart power then include the full toolbox of material, ideational, and technological assets at the disposal of state and non-state actors who are trying to influence the behaviors of others for achieving strategic outcomes, deliverables, and goals. And what is evident in Russia's religious influence building in Greece is a smart power methodology. A definite reliance on soft power, where Russia seeks to persuade those in Greece's religious field, and more broadly in society, of Russia's sole leadership 
and authentic leg uh, legitimacy in the interpretation and practice of Orthodox Christianity, vis-a-vis, -vis, they say, a corrupt, decadent West and a liberal, soft, ecumenist, ecumenical patriarchate and its Church of Greece allies. A deployment of sharp power, a panoply of internet, social media, and digital and cyber tools and platforms to penetrate the Greek religious ecosystem and society and to disseminate the ideas that I just mentioned and to create narratives about Greece's religious and uh, strategic identities. And then a tactical mix with hard power in the form of economic and financial resources that are used to incentivize and coerce and support the soft and sharp power undertakings, whether through funding or oftentimes through blackmail. <clears throat> so in short, the Moscow Patriarchate and the Kremlin are aiming to be norms protagonists, norms entrepreneurs, who use their power tools to build influence as geopolitical disruptors and transnational religious leaders in the Greek space. Now let me turn to part two, which is why Greece? Um, Greece is a crucial geospace for Russian foreign and security ambitions in the 21st century. Why? Because of the country's intersection of territorial and cultural geographies that are crucial to Russia's geo geostrategic goals. Russian foreign and security policy has gone through cycles of recalibration in the last 30 years since the end of the Cold War. And Russian decision makers have moved steadily away from a focus on former imperial borderlands and the near abroad, this notwithstanding the war in Ukraine, to a more global strategy that aims to position Russia as a great power warranting international respect because of Moscow's nuclear status and overall capacity to affect the balance of power in Eurasia and beyond. Now within this context, a constant throughout the past three decades and even before that, throughout the Cold War and over the long durée of pre-Westphalian imperial history, a constant has been Russia's unwavering focus on maximizing relations with Greece. The significance of Greece as a target for current Russian influence accrual is based on two mutually reinforcing factors. Specifically, Greece is a key target because of its role in both the NATO transatlantic alliance and the EU and within the global orthodox ecosystem. Consequently, both the Kremlin and the Moscow Patriarchate view religious influence building and malign activities in Greece through the use of Orthodox Christianity as having geometric value with regional, international, and transnational impacts. For the Russian state, Orthodoxy offers a channel for disruption inside NATO and the EU to a lesser extent, but the real focus here is on NATO. Based on aggravating fissures over shared NATO or transatlantic values about universality and westernness versus particularity and orthodox exceptionalism. And for the Russian church, orthodoxy is an instrument for displacing the ecumenical patriarchate as the leader of the world's three estimated 300 million orthodox Christians and as the primary, primary interlocutor for orthodox Christianity in international religious and secular fora. So as a consequence of this and the significance of Greece in this regard, the Church of Greece and Mount Athos have been the two primary operational spaces in which Russia is deploying religion for influence building and disruption by using the combination of soft, sharp, uh, and hard power tools that I mentioned earlier. Now why do I differentiate the Church of Greece and Mount Athos? Both lie within the sovereign territory of Greece but both have international and transnational linkages as well. So they, those linkages mean that there are both domestic policy and foreign policy dimensions to the impact of religious influence building in the respective spaces. But each space requires a different balance of approaches and tools. Now, the Russian, uh, Russia, the Kremlin, and the Patriarchate of Moscow view the Church of Greece as a norms entrepreneur. This means that the Church of Greece is an activist organization and it's an epistemic community that shapes values, norms, and practices that may or may not be aligned with the liberal rules-based international order. And this has an impact within Greece and in the broader transnational orthodox community. 
So the Church of Greece is a change agent in Greek society and beyond. And it also is important for Russian influence building because it carries historical memory that can be mobilized, shaped, activated, politicized when it comes to Greece's NATO and Orthodox identities. Its crucial historical role in the establishment of the Greek state makes the Church of Greece a stakeholder in political conversations that are related to Greek sovereignty and to the country's place within the architecture of NATO, both in terms of the values discussion and in terms of the interest discussion about national uh, security against threats, the primary uh, threat being Turkey. Mount Athos, or the Holy Mountain as it's called, has been the undisputed center of Orthodox Christian uh, spirituality since the 10th century when it was established as a monastic community under Byzantine imperial patronage. The self-governing legal personality of the monastic republic of Monathos is recognized in both the Greek constitution and EU law, European Union law, while legally part of Greek sovereign territory and administratively part of the Church of Greece, the ecclesiastical jurisdiction of Monathos belongs to the ecumenical patriarchate of Constantinople. So the Phanar, another word for the ecumenical patriarchate, the Phanar's ecclesiastical jurisdiction over Mount Athos includes approximately 20 monasteries, an estimated 2,000 monks, uh, all affiliated with the world's various Orthodox Christian patriarchates and autocephalous churches. So influence operations in the Church of Greece and on Mount Athos are consequential for the Kremlin and the Moscow Patriarchate for their respective, usually complementary, geopolitical ambitions to weaken NATO internally and to weaken the legitimacy and role of the ecumenical patriarchy. Now, um, I think I have time. It's worth mentioning, I think, that experts do disagree about um, the degree to which the Russian state and the Moscow patriarchate work collaboratively um, and who is the junior and who is the senior partner in that uh, relationship and in terms of influence building. Uh, I, I, the formulation of Caesaropapism is often used. It's inaccurate and doesn't describe the relationship. And it's a very simplistic description of what's a complex, evolving church-state relationship in the post-bipolar order era. Uh, the Russian state was undoubtedly, in the early part of the post-Cold War era, the arbiter of that partnership, largely due to the paucity of material assets at the disposal of the Church of Russia which had been devastated by the effects of systematic and egregious persecution by the Soviet regime. But empirical evidence and in interviews suggest that there's been an evolution in that church-state balance of power. Wealth accumulation has enabled the Moscow Patriarchate to accrue increasing autonomy and leverage vis-a-vis -vis the political regime over the past two decades. And it's reasonable, I think, to characterize the current moment in the church-state relationship in Russia as one of codependence and pragmatic transactionalism between Russian President Vladimir Putin and Russian Patriarch Kirill, uh, the former, as I mentioned, coming to power in 1999 and the latter enthroned in 2009. So theirs is a church-state arrangement that's defined by a pragmatic calculus whereby cooperation is seen as a win-win, mutually beneficial. That could easily change. Uh, when these two personalities leave the scene, the institutional relationship will certainly outlive them. But this is, a, um, a, this is a, I think, an accurate characterization of the current relationship. And indeed, within the rubric of religious diplomacy, Putin and Kirill have shown an agility and a sophistication in their appreciation for orthodoxy as a multidimensional tool, a theological, cultural, political, economic, and strategic tool that transcends the territorialized boundaries of states. Um, let me um, say a bit now about what underlies um, their historical reading and how that relates uh, to their view of Greece, and then give you a couple of examples of influence building in action. Both Putin and Kirill uh, share a reading of history that leads them to view Greece as a, a critical target, as I mentioned earlier, why? Moscow's concept of the Third Rome, which is informed by pretensions of theological and ecclesiastical hegemony and geopolitical imperialism, has become the main justification for the Patriarchate of Moscow's focus on Greece and focus on Greece's religious field. Now, the, there's a somewhat obscure chronography 
uh, when it comes to the exact origins of the concept of the Third Rome. But there is loose consensus that between the late 15th and mid 16th century, this messianic concept with religious and geopolitical implications was consolidated. And it was rediscovered by the Putin regime and his Eurasianist geopolitical school. Accordingly, the Patriarchate of Moscow declares itself the inheritor of the Constantinopolitan Byzantine imperial legacy. This conceptual repackaging and the twisting distortion of the Byzantine formulation of Constantinople as the new Rome to the present Muscovite formulation of Constantinople as the second Rome positions then today's Moscow as the third Rome and as the center of a new Orthodox Christian empire, foregrounding pan-Slavic identity and backgrounding Hellenism. So winning influence in the Church of Greece and on Mount Athos becomes crucial for this conceptual move and this new practical set of claims. The Third Rome narrative argues that the ecumenical patriarchate forfeited its primacy of honor and leadership of the Orthodox world when Constantinople fell into captivity in the 15th century, that is, under the Ottoman yoke. That is, according to this reading, the first captivity. And now, second captivity under the Turkish state's yoke. According to this narrative, if the first captivity was the result of Constantinople's decadence and flirtation with reunion with papists, this present captivity is the result of Constantinople's dangerous modernism expressed in ecumenical dialogue and activities and in the commitment to restoration of full Eucharistic communion with Rome and support for universal human rights. And the Church of Greece's autocephaly and continuing protection from the pollution of Constantinople ecumenism implies allegiance to an alliance with the Third Rome and the Moscow Patriarchate. Mount Athos, therefore, becomes the bastion of protection against the ecumenizing, liberalizing, modernizing Im uh, impulses of the ecumenical patriarchate, captive to a Muslim Turkish state and subservient to Western transatlantic patrons. Therefore, what is the solution? Alliance with the Third Rome. But this requires influence building. And now let me give you two examples of influence building in action. One uh, with the Church of Greece and the other on Mount Athos. Um, both examples, I think, help to elucidate one, Greece's centrality in linking geopolitical disruption and orthodox transnational competition, and two, the use of different types of power to accomplish Moscow patriarchate and Kremlin goals. The first example. The first example involves the approach of the Patriarchate of Moscow to the Holy and Great Council of the Orthodox Church, which was convened by Ecumenical Patriarch Bartholomew on Crete in 2016. Now, what on the face of it may seem like a highly specialized event focused on Orthodox theological arcana is more accurately understood, I think, in terms similar to the Second Vatican Council's importance for the Roman Catholic Church. Because by convening the 14, at the time 14, mutually recognized Orthodox churches that make up the 300 million strong Eastern Orthodox Christian uh, uh, communion worldwide, the Ecumenical Patriarchate understood the Holy and Great Council as an essential means for promoting theological and institutional ecclesiastical unity and vitality among those churches, thereby supporting their religious mission and the Patriarchate also saw this sort of unity as a means to facilitate positive concrete progress in ecumenical dialogue and action among the three main Christian trajectories of uh, Eastern Roman Catholic and Protestant Christianity. Now, why did the, where did the council occur? As I said, on Crete, in Greece. Why? And here's where we begin to see how to connect the dots of influence building. The council was originally planned for Turkey, and by the way, some um, accidents of history. Uh, everything wasn't planned. But the council was originally planned for Turkey, but the Moscow Patriarchate asked for a change of venue after Turkey had shot down a Russian plane in 2015. Now that request could have been made for anywhere. Um, one logical request would have been Geneva. Uh, the Ecumenical Patriarchate has a facility there, or Brussels. It could have been anywhere, but Moscow asked for Greece. Why was Greece important as location? 
because it offered the possibility to directly influence the Church of Greece delegation and Greek society throughout, during and following the council. And it took the fight between the Moscow Patriarchate and Constantinople inside the sovereign territorial boundaries of the Greek state, thereby giving the Kremlin an opportunity to influence build and into the Church of Greece and Mount Athos spaces, therefore an opportunity for the, for the Moscow Patriarchate to attack or to build influence in what are considered symbolic allies because of Hellenism and jurisdictionality for Constantinople. And again, note that it was due to a state request, the Kremlin, that the, the Moscow Patriarchate reiterated the request to the Ecumenical Patriarchate. So here you see this partnership, this partnership of, of shared interests between church and state. The shift in the locus then was a benefit to both political disruption and religious competition. What actually happened? Well, what happened was that despite the shift in venue, uh, the Ecumenical Patriarchate accommodated that request, and the years of preparatory talks and agenda setting that also had accommodated numerous Moscow Patriarchate re requests, and these were always framed in terms of Moscow's opposition to alleged Constantinopolitan innovations. Innovation is a, a curse word in the Orthodox world, okay? Innovations and accommodations to Westernism. What eventually happened, the Moscow Patriarchate boycotted the council. It played the role of spoiler. Building on soft power persuasive arguments about the lack of legitimacy of the Fanar to convene the council, despite having participated in all of the preparatory meetings. Um, building on these arguments, which were, had been, which were disseminated through social media platforms, through cultural centers and conferences, academic conferences, uh, the Moscow Patriarchate funding those cultural centers and conferences, using hard power, their hard power economic resources, um, in order to uh, support the soft power messaging. The Moscow Patriarchate became this last minute spoiler, and it took three other patriarchates with it, Bulgaria, Antioch, and Georgia. So Moscow's attack narrative about why it chose to boycott at the 11th hour was amplified and disseminated in digital and cyber and traditional media spaces inside Greece throughout the entire duration of the conference, of the council. And this augmented, uh, they also augmented the religious arguments in ways that led to what uh, the Archbishop of uh, Athens all, and all Greece, Hieronymus, eventually termed a divisive logic. So throughout the days leading up, the several months leading up to the council, when the decision had been made to change the venue to Greece, there was a, a media blitzkrieg on a variety of platforms about uh, skepticism regarding whether or not the council should even happen. Moscow was going to come grudgingly, but in that um, public media blitzkrieg, always the, under, the underbelly of that was questions and queries about the leg legitimacy of the ecumenical patriarchate to actually convene the council, and therefore, should the Church of Greece and other churches, but the Church of Greece, after all, which was in Greece, and, uh, and the, co the council would occur on Crete, should they go, and were they accepting the questionable legitimacy of the ecumenical patriarchate? So this was the framing in the several months leading up to the council, and it was the narrative that was disseminated, recycled through multiple echo chambers in Greece and in the broader Orthodox space throughout the council. And what the Moscow uh, narrative did is instrumentalize the Holy and Great Council in a way that promoted the Russian church as the sole guardian of Eastern Christian authenticity. Um, and it, uh, the narrative blended the protection of traditional Orthodox values with defense against transatlantic geopolitical expansionism. And again, Greece is uh, therefore the space for questioning whether or not there is support for what are considered authentic Orthodox values and whether or not uh, Greece's own territorial integrity and sovereignty is somehow conditionalized by virtue of its, um, its um, subordination to senior members in the NATO alliance. What happened is that 
Um, this narrative was spread through global audiences as well. For example, on the platforms of Carnegie Russia, in America Magazine, and in Inter Interfax, in the New York Times, in the Wall Street Journal, and of course on Greek-focused and Greek language sites such as orthodoxia.com, orthodoxos tipos, ecclesia, and others. And the Moscow Patriarchate message um, about the boycott was that it came because of ecumenical patriarch Bartholomew's papist in, uh, inclinations and ambitions, which had been evidenced, they, the narrative said, in the Orthodox Catholic dialogue and now were being consolidated at Crete. So Moscow's self-defined purists recycled and appealed to conservative hierarchical factions and segments of the, the Greek public, but in the, Greek, in the Church of Greece, who had openly opposed the visit of Pope John Paul II to Athens back in 2001. So drawing on the wellspring of grievance. Um, those opponents in the Church of Greece uh, to that visit had framed the pope as the heretic pope and the two-horned monster. Um, the narrative played on tradition and historical trauma, hearkening back to the painful memories, as the pope himself said, the painful memories and deep wounds that still cause suffering to the spirit of the Greek people caused by Latin Christians' disastrous sacking of the imperial city of Constantinople, the bastion of Christianity. So Moscow's narrative of the Holy and Great Council as both a threat to authentic Orthodox traditionalism and to the capture of Greece by liberal Western values and to uh, liberal Western values and the US and other transatlantic alliance states was reinforced then in soft and sharp power terms and supported with the economic and financial resources of hard power. And what happened is that this debate about truth that played, its, played itself out in the media came to, a, um, came to a head in the most acrimonious portion of the Holy and Great Council. And I was a delegate on the, uh, the delegation of the Ecumenical Patriarchate, so I, I watched this. Um, the most acrimonious portion of the council which was about the permissibility of Orthodox churches referring to other Christian bodies as churches. The deep fissure within the Church of Greece was on display in those debates, with several members of the delegation of the Church of Greece refusing to sign the final text. The Moscow narrative of the errant ecumenical patriarchate and his, its allies in the Church of Greece was circulated then on a host of websites, including those that I mentioned, but others as well, on Mount Athos and elsewhere, including some that, for those of you who work in this space, including Orthodox News Agency, Romfea 24-hour agency for church news, Pemtusia, the website of Mount Athos, and Katijon, which is an online global think tank that's built on civilizational arguments um, and that is funded by one of Russia's most prominent Orthodox oligarchs, Konstantin Malofiev, who's embedded himself into Greece's private sector networks and into the flow of Russian funds into Athenite monasteries. So in sum, this first example, Russia's move first to boycott the council, first to relocate the council into Greece, and then to boycott the council, and then to narrate the council in terms of um, East versus West civilizational arguments um, is the first, um, the first example that shows the mix of soft, sharp, and hard economic power resources in order to disrupt ecclesial relations between the Church of Greece and the Ecumenical Patriarchate, to position the Third Rome as the only authentic defender of global orthodoxy, and to deepen fissures within the Church of Greece about Greece's identity as part of the transatlantic Western alliance. Okay, I think, yes, I do have time for my second example. Okay, I'll turn to my second example, which is the Mount Athos space. Now, Russian influence building on Mount Athos reflects how seriously both the Moscow Patriarchate and the Kremlin take this project of persuasion, penetration, and coercion in Greece's religious ecosystem. In the two plus decades since 1999, I mentioned when Putin came to power, Amplified since Kirill's elevation in 2009 as patriarchy, Patriarch of Moscow and all Russia, Mount Athos, which Putin described as the place associated with the strengthening of the moral foundations of society, has become a priority for Russia's efforts to weaponize tradition in order to create the fissures and disruption that I've just described. 
a snapshot of Mount Athos is helpful. It's a male-only monastic space, paradoxically, since it's called the Garden of the Virgin, so I guess she wouldn't be allowed to go there if she turned up today. Um, so uh, Mount Athos, a male-only ma monastic space. It's a closed ecosystem where disinformation and misinformation can be carefully curated, disseminated, and recycled, both through digital connectivity and interpersonal connections. <clears throat> the Holy Mountain offers domestic, international, and transnational influence building opportunities directly inside the territory of the Greek state via the predominantly Greek-speaking monasteries with direct linkages to the Church of Greece, via Greek pilgrims from all segments of the political class and civil society who travel regularly to Mount Athos, but also through transnational dissemination into Greek religious and cultural diaspora spaces in Cyprus and the Middle East and Western Europe and in North America. Now, uh, Mount Athos offers a ripe space for disseminating anti-Constantinople messaging. And this was a project that ramped up exponentially after the ecumenical patriarchate's decision to grant autocephaly to the Orthodox Church of Ukraine in 2019. 2019. This was a decision that Moscow has characterized as a direct attack on the Church of Russia and as the outcome of the patriarch's adoption of non-Orthodox papist behavior and submission to Western political pressure. This is a narrative that is disseminated throughout uh, social media and digital platforms on Mount Athos and into um, the Greek, broader Greek space. Now, there are also some um, what I call global, what we know, the global local particularities of Mount Athos that explain Russian influence building priorities there. Um, Athos hosts thousands of male pilgrims annually from around the global Orthodox world. So it's a pan-Orthodox space. And these pilgrims are introduced then to a cultural space that is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. site. Um, and it's also seated on the easternmost promontory of Greece's uh, Chalcedais Halkiviki Peninsula. So it's integrated into the local economy of Halkiviki and Thessaloniki. So taken all together, uh, these, this makes Athos a very ripe space for influence building. Now, Putin's vo view of history rather than consent as the basis for legitimacy in Russia's Russian world and spiritual security planks of its foreign policy uh, was reflected in his visits to Mount Athos in 2005 and 2016. These visits were performative sanctification of Russian state nationalism and performative promotion of the Moscow Patriarchate's claims to protect, tr to protect traditional Orthodox values and spirituality. By his side in both of these visits was Patriarch Kirill, characterizing Putin as a miracle of God. Now these visits were highly mediatized in Greek television and radio, print and electronic newspapers, as well as on Church of Greece and Athenite digital platforms. Russian news agencies used economic leverage to reinforce their soft power messaging by providing low cost and free digital content to Greek news sources. And the geopolitical connotations of Putin's Mount Athos visits turned on messaging that through the monastic communities of the Holy Mountain, Russia-Greece relations, quote, could only get stronger. Accordingly, again, with Kirill by his side, Putin said, the Orthodox faith is the common basis for the relations of the peoples of Greece and Russia. And Russian monks on Mount Athos are an indestructible bond between the two countries. And Pontic Greeks who live in Russia have contributed to development of relations. So experts on the Athenite community identify monasteries that are Russian and Bulgarian speaking as sympathetic to Russian influence and pan-Slavic interests. Uh, in terms of Greek speaking monastery, monasteries, the strategic uh, target of Russian influence operations has been two in particular, both of which are major religious pilgrimage de destinations for visitors from Greece and the international Orthodox world. And influence building in those monasteries has also depended on personalized connections with their respective abbots, who are spiritual elders to many upwardly mobile priests and future clerical and lay political decision makers and civil society decision makers in Greece and within the Church of Greece. 
Now, the economic dimensions of Russia's influence operations in Greece are also evident in their embeddedness with Mount Athos. The so-called orthodox oligarchs, Russian oligarchs with lucrative investments in Greece who have ties to the Moscow Patriarchate and the Kremlin, support the cultural centers, academic conferencing, and digital platforms, and social media sites that trade in the Moscow Patriarchate's anti-Constantinopolitan theology and that attack Church of Greek, Greece hierarchs who support the Fenar's legitimacy. Two of the most well-known cases of Orthodox oligarchs who are regular visitors to Mount Athos and regular investors in the local economies around Mount Athos and more broadly in Greece are Constantine Malofiev and Ivan Savidis. Malofiev, as I noted earlier, is president of the supervisory board of the Katihon think tank. And again, that's a platform that runs regular geopolitical features by Russian Eurasianist Alexander Dugin, arguing along civilizational lines that position Russia as a defender against an expansionist West. And also, that site prominently features critics of the ecumenical patriarch for his commitment to Christian ecumenical relations. Again, the same messaging that uh, was put out with um, the uh, Holy and Great Council in Crete. Malafiv has been a regular visitor to and investor in Mount Athos, although his annual pilgrimages to the Holy Mountain have been interrupted since he was added to the EU and US sanctions lists. Now, in the case of Ivan Savidis, a tobacco tourism construction billionaire and a former member of parliament in Putin's United Russia party, he established the charitable foundation of Ivan Savidis in 2000, and its website identifies one of its major areas of activities, activity as, quote, the financial support of traditional religious communities, including church building and reconstruction of religious sites, organization of pilgrimage trips, as well as funding to Orthodox educational institutions. Savidis has been a regular visitor to Mount Athos and is reported to be a primary investor in the five-star hotel upgrades. This is the language of uh, pilgrims and priests uh, who visit these uh, these. Uh, monasteries, the five-star hotel upgrades in the pro-Russian monasteries. Um, for example, St. Padelemon has been outfitted, outfitted with 500 new rooms and an assemblage of satellite systems. And reliable sources indicate that these two um, Orthodox oligarchs, Malofiv and Savidis, are paradigmatic of a broader cohort with ties to the Moscow Patriarchate. They've invested in the economy around Mount Athos, and they've invested an estimated $200 million in that we know that's visible in reconstruction and restoration of monasteries on Mount Athos since the start of this new millennium. Now, what's most interesting then, I think, is about the investment strategies on Mount Athos is that they are linked to these broader investments in the Greek economy, in media, in hotels, and sports teams, illustrating the broader approach to Greece as a key influence building space for Russia, but with religious targets as in the Church of Greece and Mount Athos as the critical nodes linking the broader networks. So by way of conclusion, no, oh, I think I have six minutes. By way of conclusion, and I'll only take two minutes, um, I, I have some suggestions uh, as takeaways from the Greek case. First and foremost, I would say that the case shows that any meaningful understanding of contemporary international relations, particularly today in terms of the great power competition among the US, China, and Russia, needs to consider the possible salience of religion as a variable that affects this competitive game. And this implies an epistemic shift beyond the secularist ideology and secularization theorizing that has long accounted for the failure to consider the possible significance of religious ideas, institutions, and leaders in international relations. Second, a robust typology of power that differentiates between the four types of hard, soft, sharp, and smart gives us purchase into the ways in which states and non-state actors compete through influence building. Third, the intersection of Orthodox Christianity with critical geographic spaces of great power competition in Europe and Eurasia, as well as in Africa and North America, underscores the need for further research on transnational orthodoxy and on the origins and consequences of what is a quite discernible internal pluralism in global orthodoxy. Fourth, 
Greece's particularity as an orthodox majority country that is also a NATO and EU member, positioned at the intersection of three continents, Europe, Asia, and Africa, with historical and contemporary connections to the ecumenical patriarchate, especially in terms of the jurisdictional relationship of the Fanar to Mount Athos, raises the likelihood, increases the likelihood that Russia will continue to view religion as an influence building tool for geopolitical disruption and transnational religious competition in Greece. Greece's significance, in other words, will not decline. It will likely in increase. And then fifth, there's, I would say, an urgent need for a broader research agenda by which field research will enable the necessary qualitative work and by which quantitative measures can be developed and utilized to under, understand the impact of Russian religious influence building and malign activities in Greece. And hopefully some foundation will give me a big grant so that I can actually go do that field research. And then finally, in closing, the case of Russian religious influence building in Greece adds, I think, nuance to Russia's perception, narration, and assessment of what's at stake in their kinetic war in Ukraine, a war that has seen the Kirill Putin church-state partnership assume a prominent position. And what they argue is a war over territorial and religious geographies. So geopolitics understood in terms of physical territory and religio-cultural territory, pitting Western militarism and moral decadence against Russian defense through territorial control and orthodox civilizational protection. Thank you very much. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yes. <clears throat> Thank you very much for a, a very informative talk. My question was uh, um, regards primarily the role uh, of people. Uh, I mean, we're, we're talking about religion, obviously, we are also talking about uh, the practitioners, the believers, etc. So to what uh, extent uh, is this uh, uh, politics that is uh, deployed uh, through uh, different kinds of, uh, of power, permeating also uh, the ideologies of uh, everyday folk, let's say. All right, great. Thank you for the question. Um, that's a, it's a great measurement, analysis and measurement question. It gets to the impact issue. Um, I think it's difficult to answer to what degree um, this internal orthodox geopolitical competition has trickled down to the popular level. Uh, I would say anecdotally, and also in terms of some of the, the scholarship, um, that there is a, an awareness of the, um, the rupture between Constantinople and Moscow. Moscow has declared Constantinople to be schismatic. Uh, Constantinople does not consider Moscow to be schismatic after the uh, autocephaly decision. And how does that relate to sort of popular perception and behavior? It means that um, oftentimes people are told that in, in the Russian Orthodox churches, they're told that they cannot co-celebrate uh, with uh, Greek Orthodox or other Orthodox who have um, recognized the autocephaly of Ukraine. It means that um, priests are told the same thing and they then tell their communicants that. Um, there have been other popular um, impacts. For example, in December of last year, uh, 2022, the Moscow Patriar Patriarchate announced that it was uh, establishing an exarchate in Africa. Um, in, and they said that the reason they were establishing an exarchate there where the Greek Orthodox Patriarchate of Alexandria um, is understood canonically to have jurisdiction was because of Alexandria's a recognition of Ukrainian autocephaly. And what has that meant at the popular level? I mean, first of all, they, anyone can establish a church anywhere they want. I mean, that's their prerogative in terms of international law. But in terms of the internal orthodox contratemps, uh, this was seen as encroachment on canonical territory. What that's meant at the popular level is that um, <clears throat> uh, pilgrims to uh, Patriarchate of Alexandria churches have been instructed not to visit those churches. Um, uh, their pilgrims have been told they cannot celebrate or receive communion in those churches. It's also meant that uh, priests 
who were part of the Patriarchate of Alexandria, an estimated 200 of them have now uh, uh, identified themselves as part of the Moscow Patriarchate. Um, most of the anecdotal evidence suggests that that's because of the financial incentives, um, the poverty-stricken, underdeveloped, you know, human security problems of these churches. It, it means then that the popular level, uh, their communicants are being told to worship a certain way or to think a certain way. Um, so those are some of the popular things, but there's not a lot of, there isn't good scholarship out there. It's emerging, people are doing field research to try to understand the impact of these macro level competitions on micro level behaviors. But one thing is certain, and that is that in terms of um, meso and macro level orthodox relations, uh, there has been fragmentation and Fisher from the influence building and then also from the outcome and the pushback from the decision on the, on the Ukraine autocephaly decision. But the, that pushback began before that autocephaly decision and it began with the intensification of preparations for the Holy and Great Council. When the ecumenical patriarch was enthroned 30 years ago, he was very clear that um, convening the council was one of his priorities under his uh, tenure, uh, and the Moscow Patriarchate began questioning early on and challenging early on under this third Rome construct, um, his authority to convene the council. So the competition and the influence building piece predates the Ukrainian autocephaly decision. That's only aggravated tensions and fissures that had emerged before that, and that that is something that has met its way, I think, at least in a, um, a general sense of awareness at the popu to the popular level in many Orthodox majority countries and amongst Orthodox communities in what used to be called the diaspora, which has a different meaning today than historically. Hi, thank you. Um, my name is Aphrodite, Aphrodite, hi. Um, so I have so many questions, but I will ask one. <laughs> um, so on the, on the receiving side of the influence building, um, what, is, what are the Church of Greece, the government of Greece, and even, like, even investors in the diaspora, kind of, what's the reaction? Are, I mean, are they going willingly? Um, is there a, like a concerted effort to consider what to do and resist some of this? Like what? What are these? What are the different actors that are, and what's, and, and how does this? I mean, you mentioned Ivan Savidis. I know he's been investing all over the place in Thessaloniki. I lived there for a few years, and it just doesn't seem like a ton of resistance to it. Um, you know, American Greek investors um, and wealthy Greek Americans have been talking about investing in Greece for years and years and years. I've seen them at different events and all kinds of stuff talking about, we're waiting for things to devalue further to make it a good investment uh, opportunity. And then we don't really see them in Greece. I mean, it got to the extent where I think there was a, at one point when um, <laughs> a lot of people laughed about this, but I think Bill Clinton interviewed uh, uh, Alexis Tsipras when he was prime minister and people kind of joked about it, but at the same time, um, in this uh, very prominent interview, Bill Clinton kind of turned around and also said, but to also to the you know, Greek American investors, what are you waiting for? It's been years. You don't have to wait for the perfect situation to be investing in Greece to help it actually rebuild and move forward. So yeah, I'm curious what, you, what you've seen um, from these different actors and if there's actual resistance to some of this or trying to fill in the gap with a better options. Sure. Uh, I think in terms of these three kinds of power you, tools used for influence building, in particular when it comes to, you know, the um, the soft and sharp power tools, um, what we see is a really dynamic, very intense um, contestation, whether it's uh, on social media or other digital platforms, whether it's in academic conferences, whether it's in ecclesiastical gatherings, about the soft power piece of this, about the content um, when it comes to the questions of what is authentic orthodoxy and who represents that and who speaks for that. And uh, so 
Russian influence building is part of that, and it's only one part of that. And I, I think the broader context for understanding what's happening is beyond the, the story of Russian influence building. It's about um, a faith tradition that is coming to terms with its own internal pluralism. So it's very common to uh, ask people, what's the, hear people ask, what's the orthodox perspective? In fact, there are multiple orthodox perspectives on whatever issue may be at hand. And that, I think, is um, <clears throat> that kind of internal pluralism or competition over ideas um, is one that Moscow is using its own assets to try to push in a particular direction. So what does that mean in terms of how people respond? You see, you know, uh, whether it's intellectuals, whether it's uh, theologians, you know, who are affiliated with these churches, whether it's clerics, um, they respond either by voicing their support or voicing their opposition. Some of them say nothing. Um, I think many, uh, oftentimes people are very concerned about um, the punitive possibilities that go with taking a stand, you know, one way or the other. Um, but there is an active uh, conversation about what's happening and about um, the claims of Moscow to represent um, legitimate orthodoxy. Um, and not only in terms of the orthodox world, but as a defender of traditionalism vis-a-vis -vis what's seen as a um, liberal um, en encroaching decadent decadent West. In terms of the Greek government, um, I'm not sure what their response is. Um, uh, you know, as long as laws aren't broken, um, then these things can happen within existing legal frameworks. But as we know, a lot of investment activity um, is oftentimes opaque, not only in Greece, but certainly everywhere um, around the world. Uh, I think the, the real um, interesting piece of your question, though, comes with how to make sense of the intersection of economic leverage on the one hand and the consequences of economic investment and leverage for um, the competition over ideas and practices. And that goes well beyond Greece, but this is a perfect illustration of how it is that we see the intersection of economics on the one hand and free thinking and um, facts and the competitive use of facts on the other. And so this is occurring in, happens to, with the Greek case, happens to be in Greece in the religious space, but it speaks to a broader phenomenon. And that's another reason I think that for those people who work on religion, it's worth in situating religion within the context of these kind of broader um, phenomena around the world. But the, the, main, the main takeaway I would say is that there is an extraordinary pluralism, local, regional, and global, in orthodoxy. And we see that on display in these debates that are oftentimes framed and provoked and advanced um, as influence-building efforts by the Moscow Patriarchate. Yeah, hi, wonderful uh, presentation. Um, I, I, my mind didn't wander at all. Uh, <laughs> um, but I wanted to add, we've been thinking a lot uh, in the last few months about the centenary of the disaster when Greece became a place of refuge, in a sense, for Orthodox Christians. We're seeing that again to some extent. I gather that both ethnic Greeks and non-Greek non ethnic Orthodox are going as to Greece as a refuge, and I'm wondering how that changes the dynamic within Greece at the moment. I think the um, the inflow of uh, ethnic Greeks and ethnic Ukrainians um, uh, from Ukraine as a result of um, of the war. I think the most immediate impact of that will be in terms of this, you know, influence building competition, will be that, um, you know, language will be one mechanism that's used. And also a lot, of, a lot of the sites that I talked about are multilingual sites. So they're in Russian, uh, Greek, English, and sometimes in French and other languages. So there, there'll be an effort, um, you know, to target certain populations um, in their own language. Um, and I think also, 
the, the receipt of Greek, and the inflow of Greek uh, refugees from Ukraine into Greece will mean that the Moscow Patriarchate will focus even more, uh, more directly on Greece um, in order to ensure that their narrative um, isn't undermined by what's happening in the war in Ukraine. Um, so I think we'll see an intensification of uh, the kind of influence building that we're discussing here. But it may be then that there's more pushback in terms of an alternative narrative. And it, I I'm certainly hope I haven't given the impression that this, this is the hegemonic narrative, but it's one very clear narrative. And so what we see in terms of Church of Greece and on Mount Athos, I would say are three kinds of trends when it comes to um, either accepting or rejecting or accepting parts and rejecting other parts of these competing narratives. And that is a more kind of literalist interpretation of orthodox theology, which then those uh, supporters of that tend to support Moscow's construction in culture war terms about um, you know, the intersection of geopolitics and religion. A kind of mainstream traditionalism um, that uh, continues to support the ecumenical patriarchate <coughs> Uh, and reject Moscow's pretensions to hegemony. And then a more kind of, um, I would say, modernist, um, progressivist trend uh, that uh, rejects, um, out, outright rejects Moscow's formulations, but also sees the need for um, revitalization and reform in the institutional and ide ideational structures of, of orthodoxy and welcomes the kind of pluralism, religion, internal pluralism, but also, um, as you're discussing now, ethnic pluralism that comes with orthodoxy and really um, understands or tends towards to emphasize the transnational dimensions, the supranational dimensions of religious affiliation. Uh, thank you. Uh, great talk. Thank you for this talk. I just wanted to ask, um, could you comment on the extent uh, to which the, uh, the extent of the Kremlin's role in maintaining international friction between Turkey and Greece, and thus in NATO, and how this may relate to uh, its religious ambitions? I would say a couple of things. Um, I think you know uh, the uh, Kremlin Turkey, the Russia Turkey relationship um, is a very useful tool uh, for um, sowing or uh, creating deeper fissures inside NATO, both in terms of the values that NATO purports to uphold, um, and also in terms of NATO interests. And you know, I think you know what. Russia does quite expertly is point out the contradictions in between NATO's um, rhetoric and its actions when it comes to um, being a rules, upholding the rules-based international order and respecting the sovereignty and territorial integrity of other states. After all, we're now um, remembering the 20-year tw anniversary of the US invasion um, and occupation of Iraq, the destruction of which is still you know, with that country. So I think um, that, that the uh, relationship with Turkey offers an opportunity um, to sort of reiterate that um, anti-Westernism. And if you look at polling information in Turkey, it um, has some of the highest anti-Western um, numbers of any country in Europe. Um, the second thing is in terms of the military industrial relationship, the sale of S S-400s to Turkey. Um, is, is, is pretty calamitous for, for NATO. Um, so again, the relationship with Turkey offers a real opportunity for sowing fissures inside NATO. Um, when it comes to the orthodox piece, uh, I would say that um, given Moscow's pretensions to supplant the ecumenical patriarchate and the 100 years long commitment of the Turkish Republic to eliminate the ec ecumenical patriarchate, um, that that's been, again, a relationship of convenience. Um, one of the things that's quite interesting and I think instructive of the shared interest there is the concrete consequences is um, when on the eve of the decision of the um, Synod of the Ecumenical Patriarchate to, um, to grant autocephaly to, to Ukraine, uh, 
reports, there are many reports, credible reports, that say that um, there was a request from uh, the Kremlin to the government in Ankara to exert influence, try to exert influence on the Patriarchate not to take that decision. And by all accounts, that did not happen. Um, and I, I think it's very simple why that didn't happen, because um, the, the kind of fragmentation and internal tension that's been consequent to the decision is something that's been very problematic for the ecumenical patriarchate, at least in the short term. And that's in the interest of, um, of the government in Ankara. So I think that relationship between Ankara and Moscow is one um, that instrumentalizes and uh, that's opportunistic um, with regard to a shared objective and that is the elimination of the ecumenical patriarchate. And then in terms of the NATO alliance, um, sowing deep dissension uh, within NATO. And interestingly enough, as you know, well, you probably know, Turkey has not um, supported the sanctions regime uh, against Russia, which is another source of tension inside NATO. And it's selling drones to Ukraine while also not supporting the sanctions regime vis-a-vis -vis Russia. So again, that creates a lot of um, additional tension, albeit not well publicized inside NATO. These are, I mean, these are two totalitarian regimes. I mean, they're mirror, mirror images of each other. I mean, you know, they, they are totalitarianism. Uh, the state controls all of civil society. There's no media freedom. There's no speech freedom. There's no independent, independent judiciary. There's the instrumentalization of religion for um, territorial revisionism, and there's a disregard for the sovereignty and territorial integrity of their neighbors. So these are, you know, um, two sides of the same coin, interestingly enough. Okay, I would like to thank our speaker, Dr. Prodromu, and you, our audience, for tonight's talk. It has given much to think about, and I'm sure this is just the start of the discussion we will all be having over the coming days and months. We will be having a small reception in case you did not get a chance to ask Dr. Prodromu your question. Just before I go, though, I want to let you know about several upcoming SNF Center events. The People in the Past team is thrilled to be hosting an upcoming colloquium, uh, presenting the past, responsible engagement in the ancient Mediterranean history, which will take place from March 23rd to 25th in Vancouver, co-hosted by uh, Simon Fraser University and the University of British Columbia. Also on March 24th, Yorios Anonostu, the Militiades Maranakis Professor of Modern Greek Language and Culture at The Ohio State University, will be giving a talk online as part of our lecture series. Lastly, Dr. Kosis Kornetis will be visiting Vancouver the week of April 3rd as part of our ongoing collaboration with UCLA SNF Center for the Study of Hellenic Culture with details on the events to follow. Please see our website for more details about these and other events. Once again, I would like to thank both your uh, audience and our speaker. I hope that you have a great rest of your evening. Thank you.